Well, welcome to New Glarus Bible Church. I am Pastor Daryl Boomer, and I have the privilege of being the pastor here. And today we welcome the family and the friends of Cindy and Mark Yon. And uh, we are here today to celebrate uh, the life of Mark Yon. We're here today to comfort one another in the midst of our loss. And uh, the Bible, it says that we are to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Today is a day that we are going to rejoice as we look at Mark's life, as we contemplate where he is spending eternity, but we're also going to weep because of our loss. We're here to give uh, God thanks for the opportunity of knowing Mark, and uh, Mark was a very good man. He was a strong, steady, faithful Christian man, and he has affected our lives in many different ways, and that's why you're here today. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you today and we ask for your comfort. We ask for your presence. We, we pray that we would know that you are here with us in a very real way. And Lord, we pray that today that um, we would comfort one another. We pray today that we would honor Mark's life and we pray that uh, Jesus Christ would be glorified. And Lord, we pray all of these things in Christ's name. Amen. They say sometimes you win some, sometimes you lose some, and 
right now, right now I'm losing bad. I've stood on this stage night after night, reminding the broken it'll be all right. But right now, oh right now I just can't. It's easy to see when there's nothing. Bring me down. But what will I say when I'm held to the flame like I am right now? And I know you're able, and I know you can save through the fire with your mighty hand. But even if you don't, my hope is you. takes a little faith to move a mountain well good thing a little faith is all I have right now but God when you choose to leave mountains unmovable oh give me the strength to be able to sing it
My name's Caleb. Uh, Mark was my father-in-law. I have the honor to share with you all today his testimony of the day that he became a Christian and that set his life, uh, his life's path to what we know it was. So on June 27th, 1982, Mark was home alone. He uh, lived in a trailer court here in New Glarus. He was recently divorced and um, he was using drugs and alcohol quite often. Um, he heard a knock on the door, and two men were there, Juan Arn and Nathan Eula. They actually were looking for someone else. They, they had the wrong door, but uh, Lon and uh, Mark were classmates, and they grew up together, so they got into some small talk. But pretty soon, Lon and Nathan turned the conversation to Jesus. And Mark thought, oh, oh boy, here are some of those Jesus freaks. <laughs> what am I going to do to turn these guys around and close this conversation quickly? But they started talking about what it really meant to be saved. And through this conversation, they opened up Mark's eyes to an accident that he had had the previous April um, on his motorcycle. And they convinced Mark that if he had died in that accident, that he wouldn't uh, have gone to heaven. After that, they, they actually gave Mark a track called the Sport, Four Spiritual Laws. And they left. They said goodbye. So Mark went back inside. He got ready for bed. And he read through the track right before bed. Um, that track, the Four Spiritual Laws, outlined that God loves us all and that he created us to have a personal uh, relationship with him, but that we are sinners. And because of our sin, we can't be in relationship with God, and it's that sin that separates us. It says there is a path, and Jesus Christ is the only solution that God has given us um, for that sin, and that uh, it's not enough to just know this, but we must actually individually receive Christ into our lives. And when Mark was finished reading through that track, those truths, he knelt down and he prayed the prayer of salvation that was on the back of the track. It was that day in June 27th, 1982, that Mark felt his sin lifted off of him and he knew that he was truly free. He, you know, continued to have ups and downs in his life. Um, a defining moment came uh, seven years later, on May 22nd in 1989, that day he forever put his drug use behind him. Um, and he, it was at a similar time that he and Cindy committed to making Sunday school for the kids and ch regular church attendance for their family a priority. And that has held ever since. And that, those were key, key beliefs that Mark held. So this, this testimony really means two things for us. We, we get to celebrate, like we are, the awesome life of Mark, that he's a faithful man, a godly man, and that he can set an example for us as a husband, uh, as a father, um, and as a friend. But the second great thing that we get to celebrate, that Mark is right now at this moment, at peace and at rest with his heavenly father. Sending family with uh, our heartfelt condolences. I just want to share that we've had a, a large contingent of folks in Iowa praying for you guys and keeping you guys lifted up. It's a privilege to be here to uh, um, share about Mark and some of my experiences with Mark. My name is Dan Wells, and so um, Mark uh, and, and I got to know each other through church here at New Glarus Bible. And uh, when, I, when I started coming here with my family, Mark was a dairy farmer, and, and he was kind of a guy that astounded me because he often said, it's like, Mark, what do you enjoy doing? Well, we like riding motorcycles and things like that. He says, well, but what, what, you know, do you guys travel? No, I've never taken a vacation. I think, I forget how many years he said he'd never taken a vacation. Um, and we got to see Mark and Cindy transition out of the dairy farming uh, life, and I think Mark looked forward to 
finally taking some vacations and doing some things. And uh, he, uh, he came, came to us where I worked one day and said, hey, would you, would you have a job for me? And I said, yeah, yeah, we can, we can fit you in. And uh, Mark started working, and he was one of those guys that would do just about anything. I mean, if you needed him to work in this area, he never complained. He just did whatever was asked, and he was kind of a utility guy and had a superb attitude. And um, it also freed him up to do some other things. You know, he was, he was always a, a regular as an usher here at church, but then we got him into Awana. And uh, Mark was, was a silent enforcer in Sparks at Awana and, and was a great addition to that ministry, and he was very faithful. Um, <clears throat> the, we had a sleepover with the, the, the TNT boys, and, you know, those are third to sixth graders, and, and Mark was one of the stalwart guys that spent the night with us and, and helped those young boys learn verses and, and have a great experience with that. And that was just the kind of guy Mark was. Um, a little story about him at work. You know, he had made such an impression on the leadership there. We had started a, a, an initiative to make some improvements there. And Mark was chosen to be part of that group. And so we would have what's called a weekly huddle. And that's when all the top management got together with, with uh, Mark and a few of the other guys, and we'd report on our results and forecast for the month. Um, but the start of every meeting, we got to, to kind of tr trade around that group, and each one of us got to lead in that. And so part of the, the chore of leading was not just keeping the meeting organized and whatnot, but it was actually we had to give about a five to ten minute opening statement. Um, and, uh, you know, generally that was, was spent trying to give some kind of a motivational, uplifting, get the, get the group riled up kind of thing. And so when it was Mark's turn to do that, um, he, didn't, he didn't give a, a you know, he, he didn't take the same route as everyone else. As a matter of fact, what Mark did is he, he stopped and he gave his testimony. He told the group at work how he came to faith. He, he told the same story we just heard. Um, and I think if, if Mark were here, he probably wouldn't want me standing up here talking about him. He'd rather I was up here talking about Jesus. And so I, I want to share that because he shared the gospel that day. And I think one of the things that funerals do, there's a couple things that funerals do. Number one, it brings a lot of people together that haven't been together in a long time. And it's, it's kind of one of those things we say at every funeral. We should get together more often than at funerals, Right. But we don't, and here we are, and we have an opportunity to see one another. But the other thing that funerals do is it makes us confront our mortality. You know, as, um, you know, quite frankly, death is an uncomfortable, and it's an inconvenient truth. Um, I think a comic once said, and I don't mean to be trite here, but none of us get out of this alive. Ben Franklin said, two things are sure in life, death and taxes. And that's human wisdom. But godly wisdom tells us the same things. In Job 14, 5, it says, A person's days are determined. You have decreed the number of his months and have set limits that he cannot exceed. So God knows our days. We don't have control over that. God has control over that. Hebrews 9, 27 says this, Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment. So I think if Mark could share one thing from heaven right now, it would be simply this, choose Jesus. Hebrews 9.28 goes on to say, So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting on him. You see, this is the hope that Mark embraced. Jesus is the hope that allowed him to face whatever came his way. So when he was met with the fact that he had a cough, went to the doctor and found out that it's not just some cold or chest thing, he has cancer. Not just a little cancer, he has a lot of cancer. Mark could face that because he had the hope in Christ. As Paul put it, and I think it was Mark's attitude too, to live as Christ, to die as gain. He had the assurance of hope of eternal life in Christ. And it was... And and basically, cancer was powerless to change that in his life. And that is the same hope that's offered to each one of us. And that's what allowed Mark to face such an insurmountable thing as cancer. He knew that he, he served a God that was powerful enough. He was the creator of all things. It was powerful enough to, to cure that cancer. But it didn't matter because Christ was going to take care of him one way or the other. And Christ would use this to help and to magnify himself through Mark. 
So Romans 10 says this, and it tells us this, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that he is raised from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no, no difference between Jew and Gentile. We're all the same in the Lord. Of all who, and who richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So I think Mark's challenge each one of us today would be to choose Jesus. And that would be his message. And I think anyone that stands before Christ would tell us we need to choose Jesus. If you haven't made that choice, I would encourage you to do that today. I would be happy to talk to anyone here. I know Pastor would as well. I think that's the kind of legacy that Mark would like to leave and the message he would like to leave. Thank you. You were 43 when you got the news Life will be changing, nothing we can do The clock is ticking now All I can think about is knowing I have to move on Without you somehow And I just can't believe that you're the one who's keeping it together as you hold my hand and say it's okay to cry it's okay to fall apart you don't have to try to be strong when you are not and it may take some time to make sense of all your thoughts but don't ever fight your tears because there is freedom in every drop Sometimes the only way to heal a broken heart is when we fall apart. You asked me to sing some songs that I wrote, but I can barely speak, can barely play a note. All my tears rush in, falling on my strings. And make the sound of these progressions have a different ring And I hate to say goodbye Knowing this will be the last time we're together As you close your eyes and say It's okay to cry It's okay to fall apart You don't have to try to be strong when you are not and it may take some time to make sense of all your thoughts but don't ever fight your tears because there is freedom in every drop sometimes the only way to heal a broken heart is when we fall apart and you've got the gift of mercy never think it's strange not a curse but it's a blessing to feel other people's pain and always love without condition and trust with all your heart there is healing in the story of your scars well it's been a while since you've been gone Sometimes I catch myself trying to call your phone All my hopes and dreams we used to talk about They're still alive in me and I just hope I make you proud Now I'm your legacy and it's your love still holding me together And I can hear you say it's okay to cry it's okay to fall apart you don't have to try to be strong when you are not and it may take some time to make sense of all your thoughts but don't
don't ever fight your tears Cause there is freedom in every drop Sometimes the only way to heal a broken heart Is when we fall apart Sometimes the only way to heal a broken heart Is when we fall apart It has been a long journey since we first heard that um, Mark had lung cancer. And it's been especially long for those who are closest to Mark. Uh, there have been seasons of hope marked by seasons of despair. There have been many sleepless nights. There have been many trips to the hospital, many x-rays. There have been many prayers sent up to our Heavenly Father pleading that God would heal Mark. But our Heavenly Father, in His goodness and in His sovereignty, has chosen to answer those prayers in a different way. But each of our prayers was ultimately marked with this. God, may your kingdom come, and may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I have four goals today as I walk through this message. And the first goal is this, is to, to give comfort and to give hope. Our Heavenly Father is good, and even though we may not be able to understand that fully at this time, in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, it says that God works all things together for the good of those who love God and who are called according to His decree. It does not say that all things are good, but all things work together for the good, and we cannot fully understand that at this time. Uh, as we look at the situation today, we would say, Lord, this isn't good. This isn't good. But we don't fully understand the mind and the heart of God. We don't know how God is going to use Mark's life and Mark's death in the lives of us, in the lives that are here today, and in the lives of others. So what we ask for God at this time is comfort and hope. And we find that comfort and hope in God's word. In Psalm 34, it says this. It says that the Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. At this time, right now, the Lord is close. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, it says, Brothers, Paul writes, We do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep, those who have died, or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. Paul writes to his brothers, Christians, followers of Christ, and he tells them that he doesn't want them to be ignorant about what happens after a Christian has died. And he doesn't want them to grieve like those who don't know what happens after we die. And so we don't have to be ignorant about what happens after a Christian dies, and we don't have to grieve because we know that when a Christian dies, he immediately goes to heaven be with Jesus. It says, Paul writes, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And we don't have to grieve like those who have no hope. We grieve. We have suffered a great loss. Cindy has lost her husband and her best friend, the father of her children. And it's natural to grieve that loss. Uh, some of you have lost your father. Some of you have lost your grandfather. And many of us have lost a friend. But we don't have to grieve like those who have no hope because the scriptures say that every committed Christian, one moment after they die, are spending eternity in heaven with their heavenly Father. And we take comfort in that. We take comfort in the fact that we know that Mark is in heaven. In John chapter 6, Jesus said, All that the Father gives to me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. 
For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And that is that none, that I shall lose none of all that he has given to me, but raise them up on the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone, everyone who looks to the Son and who believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. We know for certain that many years ago, June 1982, as we have heard, two men walked into Mark's trailer at the trailer court at a, at a very critical juncture in Mark's life, and they shared the gospel. Uh, they talked about the fact that we can have a relationship with God uh, as we place our faith in Jesus. And uh, we know that Mark did it on that day. And as it says in the scripture that we're looking at here, that uh, Jesus says, I'll never lose one who the Lord has given to me. And so Jesus saved Mark that day, and Jesus is safe at home in heaven. And we take comfort in that. In Revelation chapter 21, it tells us that Mark is with God in heaven, and then it also says this about heaven, God himself will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Um, we find comfort in the fact that Mark is no longer in pain. Another goal today is to give Mark in his life honor we want to celebrate his life the bible tells us that we are to give honor to those who whom honor is due and mark mark's life is worthy of honor uh, the verse that i was given to, to share today is out of second timothy which says this i have fought the good fight i have finished the race i have kept the faith now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness which the lord the righteous judge will, judge will award to me on that day and not only to me but also to all who have longed for his appearing mark fought the good fight he finished the race I, I was looking at these pictures over here on the board, and uh, Mark was two years younger than I, and I was thinking that if I grew up in New Glarus, Mark would have been a really good friend of mine. We had many different, or many similar interests. And, but I've only known Mark for two years, but this is what I've learned about Mark. Mark was not loud. He was not boisterous. He was a man that influenced others quietly and humbly. He, he, he was friendly, and he had, this, he had this quiet chuckle. And right now, those of you that know him best, you can hear his, his quiet chuckle. And during that time, what I saw is that Mark uh, faithfully chose to follow Christ. When I arrived here, he was uh, working with our Awana. He was working with the children and serving there, as Dan had stated uh, when I arrived, uh, Mark was our head usher, and, and every Sunday morning he faithfully stood by the door upstairs, and he greeted people, and he, he tended to their needs. When, when um, Before cancer, Mark was a, a regular part of our men's Bible study. He was faithful. He was a servant. I saw Mark's relationship with Cindy. He was a good husband. He was a good father. He was a good grandfather. And I've talked to others and asked them what they saw in Mark's life. And the comments that I got were these. Mark was solid. He did not fluctuate with his feelings. He was steady. Uh, more than one person pointed out to me that in all the years that they had known him, they never heard him speak negatively about others. And Mark's life has touched the lives of many others. Those that are here today would acknowledge Mark's quiet influence upon their life. So today we celebrate and we honor Mark. But another goal today is that we would give God glory. We would give God glory. God is the one who gave Mark life. God is the one who drew Mark into a relationship. God is the one who gave Mark eternal life. God is the one who changed Mark's life, transformed it to be the person that we knew. Uh, what happened in Mark's life back in June of 1982 was this. Mark was born again. 
Uh, the Bible makes it very, very clear. Jesus said that no one can enter into the kingdom of God unless he is born again, born of the Spirit. And the goodness that we saw in Mark's life was this. It was God's Holy Spirit working in and through him. It was God's Holy Spirit that made Mark good. It was God's Holy Spirit that, that um, filled Mark's life with love for others, filled his life with patience, filled it with goodness, and filled it with kindness. When you looked at Mark, what you saw was God working through him. And that's what attracted us to him. And then my last goal for today is this, is to give us all an opportunity to join Mark in heaven. You know, earlier this week I was talking to Dan who gave the eulogy and just kind of seeing where each of us were going with the messages. And, and Dan said, you know, I don't really think that, that Mark would want us to give him the glory. I think that what Mark would want us to do would share the gospel. And you've heard that this morning. You heard the gospel from, from Caleb. You've heard it from Dan. And uh, now you're going to hear it from me. Mark would have wanted you to hear the good news of the gospel. But the good news is only good news if we understand the bad news. And the bad news is this. Being religious won't get you to heaven. Being good won't get you into heaven. Uh, the bad news is that we have all sinned and that we have all fallen short of the glory of God. In Psalm 130, it says this, If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? It's a rhetorical question. The answer is no one. No one could stand. But then there's encouragement in that verse because it says, But with you there is forgiveness. But with you there is forgiveness. It says in Ecclesiastes, There is not a righteous man on the earth who does right and who never sins. So we are all sinners and we are separated from a holy God who loves us. Well, then how do we get to heaven? How do we do that? In, in John chapter 3, Jesus said, For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only Son, and whoever believes in him shall never perish, but have eternal life. Well, how do we possess this eternal life? Uh, how are we forgiven of our sins? By truly placing your faith in Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. He lived a perfectly sinless life, and then he went to the cross to die in our behalf so that we might be forgiven. He took our sins upon himself. He was our sin bearer. And this is God's only plan to get us into heaven. Because none of us are good enough. And none of us can get to heaven by being religious or by being good. So more than anything, I believe that what Mark would desire today is that today that you would place your faith in Jesus Christ. That today you would begin a, a, a relationship with him that today you would begin to walk with Jesus so that God could transform your life much in the way he transformed Mark's life and so that you too could have this hope of heaven let's pray God you are the God of all comfort and today what we ask for is your comfort Someone significant in our lives has died, and we will miss him. But we are comforted in the fact that he is in heaven with you, where there is no more mourning, no more tears, or no more pain. God, we acknowledge that we fall short of your glory. We acknowledge that we sin, and we sin because we are sinners. It's in our DNA, and we acknowledge that our sin separates us from our relationship with you. And we acknowledge that we can't be good enough or religious enough to get into heaven on our own merits. And Lord, we acknowledge that. And today I pray that many people would place their faith in Christ as their Lord and as their Savior. So Lord, I pray that today that some would confess their need for you. They confess their need for forgiveness of sins. And I pray that today that they would, for the first time, place their faith in you. And I pray all of these things in Christ's name.
Amen. To close our service this morning, one of the songs that Mark requested was When the Saints Go Marching In. So if you will please stand with us as we celebrate Mark's life and we celebrate the fact that he is with the Lord. For those of you that didn't get a chance to spend time with Cindy and her family, um, this will be your opportunity to do that. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to um, convert this uh, sanctuary into a dining hall. <laughs> and so in other words, what we have to do is we have to rearrange this area. And so um, some of you will have to spill out into the fellowship hall, maybe out into the parking lot uh, while we transform that. And at the same time, um, there will be many of us that will be going up to the Swiss um, graveside and doing a brief uh, service for Mark there. Um, so as we are dismissed here, um, would the men from our church please stand that will, uh, from the men from our church, will you guys stand? Um, so these guys will be converting this sanctuary into uh, a luncheon room and if you want to join them you can do that um, but the others we're going to ask that perhaps you spill out in that direction so that we can do that and then some of you will want to follow us up to the Swiss cemetery and uh, we will be having a luncheon here in approximately an hour and you're all invited so with that you're dismissed mm -hmm.